So hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Marcel Stieber. If you're here to hear about solar systems, you're in the right spot. And not the one with nine or eight planets, depending on when you went to school, but the one that has the sun involved and generating electricity to power your radios. So first off, a little introduction. Um, can everyone hear me OK in the back as well? OK, excellent. Um, so my name is Marcel Stieber, um, Alpha India 6, Mike Sierra. First license in 2008 um, at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. How many Mustangs in the room? Cal Poly graduates? Good number out there. Um, so it's always nice to see that. Uh, I got my electrical engineering degree there, started playing with radios when I was in college, um, started playing with solar when I was in college, uh, and involved with various groups in the South Bay area, and still with the Cal Poly University Club as well. Like three volt cells and powered a little robot or a little LED light, so that was fun. But really, properly since about uh, 2010, um, well, the Wildfire Triathlon is one of the big events that we're involved with. We did a lot of off-grid solar systems for that, and that's really where I started dabbling in that. Um, currently, my little bragging right is I've got two off-grid radio sites running um, for the Cupertino ARCnet system. One of them has been running non-stop since 2016, so it just hit its two-year mark and has never had a blip in power, which is amazing, so I'm always very happy to see that. Um, yeah, so this talk we're going to go through solar systems. Now, Photovoltaic solar systems are complicated. We can spend six months on the topic and go into great depth. So I'm gonna to try to provide a high enough level overview that goes into enough technical depth that you can kind of get started as well. Also a dabbling in the room. Um, cool. So I think that's kind of a good baseline. Everyone owns a solar panel pretty much, so uh, that's a, always a good starting point. And yes, those little Harbor Freight flashlights do count. So. <laughs> All right, so this is the walkthrough. Um, we'll start with a brief introduction, kind of talk philosophically about solar and um, what we're thinking and doing here, um, and then go through the four major systems of an off-grid site. So your DC loads, um, how to calculate those, the battery system, which is obviously pretty important, uh, the solar panels, the solar controller, those are the four big building blocks, um, and then get a couple pictures of deployment and maintenance at the end for some good, fun photos um, that I'm sure you guys will enjoy. Um, this is photo courtesy of W6ECE. Um, it's one of their off-grid radio sites uh, out here in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And that one uh, runs a simulcast system, pretty cool. Hmm. All right, so brief introduction. Why solar? Well, everyone wants to power their radios, right? That's really reason number one. I want to use my radios, so I need power for them. And getting grid power is really expensive. How many people have gotten a quote from PG&E for running the power out to some place that didn't have power? <laughs> it's a lot. Right, a couple hands back there. Yeah, yeah. ten thousand, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand. Yeah, getting nods, right? So that's kind of the order of magnitude you're looking at, depending on the distance and how much they have to do. Um, so that's not always an option for commercial radio sites. It usually is if it's near an urban area, um, but for us hams, that's a lot of money. So off grid really gives you this independence that you can set up stuff wherever you want, um, and how to run, so you can control and power systems anywhere. So this photo here is at Santa Margarita Ranch. We wanted to set up a radio system and it needed to run for more than our batteries could power it for. So we added some solar panels and it ran for several weeks for an event that we were doing set up and then supporting. Um, a quick aside between residential versus radio sites. Residential sites, if you're building like a cabin in the woods and powering all the stuff in your cabin, you're often gonna wanna power some AC sources. So that would involve microwaves, fridges, TVs, that sort of thing. Um, and then you need an inverter in the system. So on the bottom right of this diagram, you've got your inverter and AC loads. Um, for a radio site, usually you don't have AC systems if you're going off-grid. Um, most of your radio, radios and systems are DC powered. So we're gonna simplify this diagram and just look at those four blocks on the left um, for the purpose of this talk. Um, similarly, we're going to make the assumptions we're going completely off-grid, like this in the title of the talk, so we're not going to be AC tied at all. Um, we're only going to be using the DC loads, as I just mentioned, and the mental model to kind of get started in this space is to use off-the-shelf solutions. So for radio systems and a lot of things that we hams like to dabble with, buying building blocks and assembling them together is a lot easier than building your own maximum power point tracker um, and circuit board design and all that, so not all of us are capable of that, so it's more fun to get into it by starting with off the shelf. So that's kind of the mental model here. Um, the other thing to kind of wrap your head around with off-grid sites is that they're always designed for the worst case, right? So that means in the middle of the summer, you really don't need to worry about this thing. There's a lot of sun, the days are long, you're always getting power in your system, the clouds don't roll over unless you're in the UK or up in Seattle, so here is generally pretty good. Um, 
So you need to plan for those short days in the winter when everything's cold, when it's overcast, when the sun's only in the sky for a couple hours a day, um, and when your system's running maximum. So if you're building a system for emergency communications, um, when's that worst case gonna hit? It's when the storm hurricane clouds are going overhead, when your solar panel is covered by a bunch of palm leaves that fell down, um, and everyone's using the system at 100%. So that's kind of the mental model here. So we really wanna get to this 100% uptime, get the system running in all conditions. I love this photo down below. This is a lady at Burning Man with a leaf blower blowing dust off the solar panels for their off system. Uh, and they have to do that multiple times a day. So it kind of gets you an idea of what you have to deal with. So the case study. So this is what we're going to use during the talk as kind of our baseline for um, the numbers that we're going to use. Uh, if you've seen my talk in previous years or on my CareZ site, um, this ArcNet project for Cupertino is a wireless emergency intranet. So it's a kind of like a mesh network system that hooks up a whole bunch of different radio sites, um, emergency sites around the city together using a 5 gigahertz backbone. So each of these sites, um, some of them are grid tied because they sit at the service center of the EOC, um, but most of them are off grid. So this specific site um, is completely off grid and that's kind of the four pieces that it has an uplink radio, a local Wi-Fi access point, um, a webcam just for monitoring the site and for situational awareness, and then a phone system for um, dialing between the sites for non cams so we'll use that to kind of guide our discussion and get some numbers around this. All right, ready to jump in? All right, DC loads. So the first thing when you're trying to do a solar system is figure out what do you want to do. Uh, so this could be a weather station. There are a lot of solar powered weather stations out there. They're low power, they're pretty easy to deploy. They only need to send out a radio beacon every, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes, an hour, um, or if it's not changing much a couple times a day. Uh, you might want to set up a repeater site, uh, an APRS digipeater, very common as well to be on solar, a uh, mesh network node, the example that I'm giving, uh, or a remote base station. Again, anywhere where you want to set up a radio system that you don't have grid power. So the most important thing here, and yes, this is like one of my wordiest slides, is figuring out your, your power requirements, right? So when we start this up out of the whole DC load section, we need to get to a point where we can get this watt hours per day. So this is the amount of power that you're consuming in a 24-hour period um, for this radio site. And for all the people taking pictures, the slides will be online so you can get them later too. It saves you the trouble. <laughs> no worries. Um, so for this watt hours per day, um, we can kind of walk through a couple rough examples and then we'll look at the, the one I'm talking about. So if we want to run a 50-watt repeater at 100% duty cycle, that means it's always running 50 watts of RF, um, we'll use the Yesu VR2X as an example. Uh, that radio runs at 13 amps on transmit. So 13 amps, that's about 150 watts of DC at 12 volts. Um, over a 24 hour day, is almost 6,000 watt hours, okay? So just use that as kind of an idea. If you have a 50 watt repeater, it's like 6,000 watt hours, okay? Another example, if you take that same repeater but you're only running it at 10% duty cycle, so that means 10% of the time it's running at 150 watts, but then 90% of the time it's running at only 20 watts, that's its receive um, power number. <coughs> then you're looking at 800 watt hours a day, right? So order of magnitude difference there. So when you're doing these calculations, it's critical to actually look at your real usage, right? If you design your system for 6,000 watt hours a day, yes, it'll work 24 seven nonstop for the seven day fire with, you know, 100% cloud cover and no solar panels anymore, but it's also gonna cost you a lot more money because you're putting a lot more equipment into it. Um, and then kind of a last example, 10 watt digipeter running full steam is gonna be 240 watt hours a day. 24 times 10 is 240, it's an easy one, okay? So for our ArcNet system, we're gonna use one of these lovely online calculators, links provided in the description. Um, and these calculators are a really easy way to just plug in the numbers and do it. You can obviously do this in Excel, um, but this is kind of a helpful um, tool to guide you th through that process. So if we take this site, we've got five pieces of equipment that are powered off this system. Um, and each of these pieces of equipment has a data sheet online. And in that data sheet, I can read and see how much, how many watts this thing consumes. That's usually a peak watt number. So we'll throw that peak watt number into the DC watts category. So our uplink radio, for example, is 12 watts and tw is gonna be running 24 hours a day. Um, the wireless access point is only eight watts and that runs also 24 hours a day. So you add these all up, you put them in a lovely calculator, and then you get a number, 894. So this site, theoretical, 
maximum watt hours per day is 894 watt hours. Okay, so store that number in our memory and uh, we'll use that down the line. Okay, so we've calculated our DC loads and now we're going to switch to our batteries. Decompress. Okay, batteries. This one's going to get a little contentious. Okay, so for solar systems, and I'm going to just start it here. People were asking me earlier in the hallway, oh, we're going to talk about lithium ion batteries. We can talk about lithium ion batteries briefly. For solar systems currently today, lithium ion batteries are generally still the cheapest and most straightforward battery for cost versus capacity, right? So you're looking at, you know, you can get them as cheap as a buck, a buck fifty per watt hour type of thing, or sorry, per amp hour. Um, so generally solar systems and off-grid solar sites still use those. Lithium can be used. Um, it's generally quite a bit more expensive. Uh, I've got a slide later. It's like anywhere from 5 to 10x depending on the capacities you're looking at. Uh, there's, you need different controllers, you need different things to manage them. Um, they handle temperatures differently, they handle cycling differently. Um, but generally speaking, the industry is kind of standardized on lead acid batteries because they're really common and everyone knows a lot about them. So there's a lot of prior knowledge in setting up the site. So my recommendation, and just kind of put it out there, just start with lead acid. They're cheap, they're easy to get on Amazon, free shipping and everything, and you can use them. Question? Do you have any experience with nickel iron batteries? Uh, nickel iron batteries, I haven't played with them personally. Okay. I guess kind of the same comment. Anything besides what everyone else is using, you're gonna have to do more work on to understand and to optimize and make sure it works. And getting replacements is generally not as easy. So um, you can walk into any hardware store and get a 12 volt battery. So kind of helpful. Uh, generally 12 volts. Um, now for a radio site, we're probably gonna run 12 volts. In my particular instance, most of the system, most of that site runs on 24 volts. So we're gonna take two 12 volt batteries and put them on top of each other. And then they're 24 volts. It's magical. Um, uh, and yeah, that's batteries. Summary. Okay. So sizing a battery bank. So the key thing here for an off-grid site, right, is that we need to have enough power to, well, obviously make it through the night, right? So the first starting point is you have to make it through one day where you have sun during the day, so it needs to be enough to recharge your batteries and power the radios during the day. And then when the sun goes down, or later in the day when you get less energy from the sun, because um, it's going through more atmosphere and it's at an angle to your panel, uh, you need to still be able to run your site overnight and then into the next day. All right, so that's an easy one. Now, the other one we need to think about is, well, how many days do we need to run without the sun being there? Oh, no, the sun's gone. What happened? Well, there are clouds. There are, you know, a, leaf, a whole bunch of leaves fell on your panel. Uh, you're burning man. You've got a dust on your panel. Uh, maybe snow fell on your panel. That's not common right around here, but very common in other places of the world. So they set up their panels so that the angle of the panels lets the snow slide off them, or they have to put heaters in there, and then you're wasting power on heating. Um, or you send someone out there every time it snows with a shovel. Okay. So uh, typical cloudy days only produce somewhere from kind of 20 to 40 percent of the solar output of your panel. So you can see how that plays with your power budget. Now you need a panel that's five times the size if you have a lot of cloudy days. So if you're planning a site for London or Seattle, um, you might need to get much more solar coverage to actually make that work. Second one is temperature. Temperature significantly affects the capacity of batteries and the ability of them to exchange ions um, in their chemistry. So colder temperatures always make the battery worse, pretty much. That's kind of a general statement. Um, as a result, you need to derate the batteries. And when you're designing your bank and picking how big your batteries need to be, you need to account for the coldest temperatures your battery is going to see. Again, worst case scenario for off-grid. It's that winter time period, it's the coldest then, you also get the least amount of sun and the shortest days, right? So everything's playing against us in the winter, so you have to really calculate based on that. And then the last one here is what's known as depth of discharge. I'm not gonna get into detail. If people wanna look at the appendix, I've got a nice graph that shows. If you take a battery and you always fill it to 100%, and then every single time you use it, you drain it all the way to zero, and then you fill it all the way back up to 100%, that's a complete discharge cycle. So your depth of discharge is 100%. Um, that's not very good for batteries. They don't last very long when you do that. Um, batteries, lead acid batteries specifically, but many chemistries are like this, are much happier if you only discharge and charge in a small range of their capacity. So in this case, for lead acid, the typical number that people throw out is a 50% depth of discharge number. So with a 50% depth of discharge, your kind of rule of thumb, when you finished all your calculations, you double that number, and then your pack is twice as big, so that discharge cycle would only do 
right? So that's kind of your mental model. Um, so typically, kind of industry standard around off-grid radio sites is three days of no no sun or minimal sun, and then 50, and that would get you to 50% depth of depth of discharge. But overkill depending on where you are, um, but that's kind of what's used for sites that are critical to stay online. Case study. Now, it's a lot of math on this one. I'm not used to giving talks with this much numbers. Now it's easy math, that's a good thing, right? So if we go back, remember that 894 number that we all put into our memory banks? Well, we're pulling that out again, right? So our 894 was the watt hours per day we needed for this radio site, right? If we're gonna calculate for three backup days, we have to multiply that by three. So 894 times three. The third number is a temperature D rating. There are tables online you can look up for different battery chemistries. If we say it's never going to get below 30 degrees Fahrenheit, which is probably about right, it might actually not get that cold if it's in a radio cabinet or in a building. It might not actually get that cold if you're in the Bay Area, for example. Um, if you're up in Truckee, it would be a different story. So you pull that D rating number out, 1.4 in this example, so that's a 40% size up, right? Just to think about that. And then this 50% depth of discharge. So divide by 50, the same thing, or 50%, same thing as multiplying by two. That gets us to our 7,500 watt hour number. Right, so that's a lot of watt hours. Uh, if we think back to that first example, that's the size roughly of just that 150 watt ESA repeater running 100% duty cycle for a day. Right, so that's the amount of power if you think about it. So in our case, we were doing a 24 volt system, so when you get this watt hour number, you need to turn it into amp hours for the batteries. And the amp hours, um, is you do that by dividing by the battery voltage, so your bank of voltage that you're gonna be using. So we're using two 12 volt batteries on top of each other. So if I have 200 amp hour batteries um, that are 12 volts each, that turns it into 24 volts at 100 amp hours. So when we divide by 24 volts in this case, we get 313. Okay, remember that number now. Okay, so we deleted the old one. Actually, I'll keep that one in your secondary tier and cache memory. Um, 313, right? So 313 is where we're at right now. This is the size of the battery bank that according to theory, we want to build this site to so that we can run three days at a time without any sun. So you could go and unplug the solar panel for three days and come back and after three days, you have 50% of your battery pack left, right? That's what we're doing here, right? Cool, let's plug that into an online calculator real quick. Same thing, 894, three days, 30 degrees Fahrenheit, and they give us a slightly higher number, 360 instead of 313, but hey, that's good. Right, so if you don't want to do this math by yourself, visit this lovely website, link's also in the description, and it'll give you a nice little calculator that'll pump out these numbers for you. Okay, so what does this look like? Well, our little radio site that we're building for ArcNet, um, that would mean it's four 200 amp hour batteries, or eight 100 amp hour 12 volt batteries. That's a lot of batteries. So one 100 amp hour 12 volt battery is somewhere in the like 85 pound range, so they're Bigger. They're bigger than your car starter batteries, right? Um, they're about 150 bucks each, 180 bucks each, somewhere in that order of magnitude. Um, and that's a lot of batteries. Uh, here's that lithium battery pack. So an equivalent one is $200 versus $1,800. Just give you an idea. One more reason not to do lithium, but lithium is great for other points. Um, so what do we actually need, right? So if we look at that number, I did not build that site with 800 amp hour batteries, right? Uh, when we actually looked at it, um, and we plugged it in, on the bottom right here you see the actual power consumption of this system during the day when it's talking and systems are connected and we're using it. We're only using 0.7 amps, which calculates out to 18 watts versus the original calculation was 37 watts when you added up the DC watts column from the calculator. So that's about half of what um, we technically needed. Now this is a standard use case. Yes, maybe if we have a couple more users on the Wi-Fi access point, if you're running a more high-powered data streams of your uplink radio, that number might go up a little bit. Um, but that's an order of magnitude off too, right? So a factor of two here, we can save a lot of money, several hundreds of dollars, by putting in less batteries. So the factors that come into play here is getting actual measurements from your system, right, and being realistic with it. If you need this system to be 100%, like 100% reliable in all emergency situations with everything running maximum, yes, use the theory. If you don't, and you have actual usage numbers that you can rely on, then you don't have to design for the worst and the worst and the worst and the worst case, maybe just two of the worst and then the average use cases after that, right? And then you can get to a more reasonable number. So when we plug that in here, let's say we're gonna cut that original 894 number in half, so roughly 450, 
Um, we're not going to go for three days because Cupertino really doesn't get that much like coverage, and they usually have sun, so we'll get some recovery. Um, we can put a bigger solar panel in too to help recover some of that sunlight when it's cloudy. So we're going to go to two days. We're still going to use a 30 Fahrenheit number just to be safe. Um, when we actually run these numbers, we get down to 113. Right? Wow, that's way better. Okay, so that's not eight of these batteries. That's only two and a half of these batteries. So that makes me more comfortable. So uh, this is actually what we did. So for this radio site, we ended up doing two 100 amp hour batteries. You see them down here below, and um, 24 volts. So they're in series, which means it's a combined capacity there gets you to that 100 amp hour number. Right? Battery packs. Questions? They look to be uh, slightly two different sizes. Is that? Uh, I think that's just the camera lens from that angle. They are the exact same battery from the same pallet from Amazon. It's fun when you order 10 of these and set up a bunch of different sites, it comes on a big pallet. Well, I think we're well, throwing them battery. off is because one, the batteries... Yeah, one of them flipped, right? Yeah, so they're rotated since the, the terminals. We wanted to pause them and be close to each other so we can run the jumper between them for the series. Yeah. Cool. All right. Batteries. How are we on time? Very good. All right. Solar panel is the next big part. Solar panels is the whole fun part. This is why we're all here, right? So uh, the mental model we need to assume here. So for a grid-type system, so this goes to your residential systems, if you're pumping power back to PG&E and they're paying you money for all that power you're giving them back, you want to maximize your annual production because that will give you the most power that you're, getting, that you're selling back to someone. That means you're going to get the fastest return on investment for installing that solar system on your house. Right? So when you're setting up solar panels for a residential setup, you're going to be putting them on your roof at the angles such that you maximize your production during the summer. There's a lot of sunlight in the summer, the days are long, the sun's high in the sky. You're going to optimize your panel, like this on the right, to a very flat angle relative to the sun and get as much of that daylight as you can. Right? When we're off grid, again, worst case, worst case, worst case. right? So we need to figure out the maximum power for the absolute shortest day of the year, which is winter solstice, right? So in December-ish, you're going to have this really, really short day where you wake up before the sun rises and you're back home after the sun sets, typical if you're working 8 to 5. Um, and you want your solar panels to adjust for that accordingly. So in the northern hemisphere, of course, we're going to point the solar panels to south because that's where the sun lies. That's where it's going to be at the highest point during the day. And the key thing here is that we want to match the angle of the solar panel to that point on that shortest day to maximize the amount of power we get from the sun on that shortest day. Um, with solar panels, the incidence angle, so you want the sun to be at a normal angle to the panel. So you want it pointed exactly at the sun where you want the most sunlight. As soon as you start twisting the solar panel off that axis in any direction, you're going to reduce the output that that solar panel can produce. Um, that's why you have tracking solar panel systems, right, that follow the sun during the day to maximize the amount of power they get throughout the day. You could also do one of those, but that's more complicated. So that's kind of the mental model. Um, when we actually think about how big this solar panel needs to be, um, we've got kind of two numbers we need to play with. One is the second one, the how much power. That was the watt hours per day number we had gotten earlier. Um, and then the other one is this peak sunlight hours. So peak sunlight hours is how much sun you get on that shortest day, right? Uh, there are some definitions out there that say, oh, it's when the sunlight is over 1,000 watts per square meter. Um, and that's the peak sunlight hour numbers. And then there are all these lovely graphs and tables you can find all over the internet that are all slightly different, but roughly close enough for ham work um, that tell you what the average peak sun hours are per month in various different cities. Right? So those account for the sunlight. Some of the websites will account for cloud cover as well and actually factor that in based on average cloud cover for an area. Um, so these are kind of the numbers you need to use for calculating this. So there's this insulation map, um, and this tells you how much sun you're getting. Um, and you'll see the spots that are nice hot spots. Arizona is a great one. Um, Sahara, West Africa is a lo lovely one. Down in Chile, you've got some good spots. Um, Russia is not so good. They've got much less sun up there. Uh, same with Alaska, if you go going way up there. So if you look at these numbers, San Francisco gives you a 3.4 hours of peak sun. That's a really short day when you think about it. But again, it's this over a thousand watt hour number. So even if your day is seven or eight hours long, you're only getting some subset of that that's actually good, usable, large amount of power production for your solar panel. So uh, yeah, San Francisco 3.4, 
go up to Seattle, you're less than half that, 1.4. Tucson, you're up to five, and then Fairbanks, 0.3, right? So during the winter, the sun doesn't go up very high when you're in Alaska, and it's going through a lot of atmosphere, and it's only up there for a little bit before it goes back down. So it's really difficult to set up one of these and get it running continuously when you're in Alaska. You're gonna have to way size up your battery banks and way size up your solar panels to accommodate all that. Okay. Pro tip, set one up in Arizona first. Okay. <laughs> okay, so in our example, we're going back. We're not using that 894 number. We said that was a little ridiculous. We're gonna use that 450 number, nice and round number. We pulled that 3.4 hours of peak sunlight hours from the table on the last page for San Francisco, close enough, Cupertino. Um, and then we get this 130 watts per day. So that's, in theory, how much power we need our panel to produce to keep up with the system. That means recharging it and providing enough juice. So recharging the, the pack and recharging and getting the system up and running. Um, in our case, that'd be you know, using kind of normal size of the panels, one 200 watt panel or two 100 watt panels. Um, the more panel you put here, again, the more headroom you have. So the faster your pack will recharge in the morning, one of the sites I have set up in within 45 minutes of the sun rising in the morning, the whole site is recharged, right? So that's probably an overkill. We intentionally designed that one with more solar panels because they get more dust on them and you have to maintain them more often, um, but it gives you more headroom, so there's less room for air. You don't have to have it running perfectly. So uh, in our case, uh, Amazon had a great deal on these uh, Renogy 250 watt solar panels. They're pretty, they're very large, 250 watts, and some lovely numbers here that we'll use later. Um, yeah, big panel. That's a really big panel, and they're fun. Uh, question? Price. Uh, I don't remember that one. Uh, if you're getting around the dollar to dollar fifty per watt, that's pretty good. Pretty darn good. If you go to uh, Craigslist, you can get some pretty good deals. Actually, in the South Bay area, there's a company that sells the overstock from a lot of solar installers, and you can get big size panels in this kind of order of magnitude, really cheap, uh, less than a dollar per watt. Uh, but you have to go down there during weekdays, which for retired people is great, but not for everyone else that works. Um, uh, do be careful when you buy panels. Uh, if you buy panels that don't have a nice aluminum frame and mounting hardware on them, uh, make sure you know how you're going to mount them. Um, we had a less than ideal experience buying a whole bunch of panels that were uh, sandwiched glass panels um, and a cadmium telluride, I believe, and they didn't have any mounting hardware. And finding that mounting hardware was close to impossible because no one makes these anymore. So there's one reseller in like Florida that would sell me the entire remaining stock of what they had, but I had to buy all of it. So I just spent like $200 just getting these mounting brackets for this thing. So know how you're gonna mount it and think about that in advance. Okay, step four, solar controller. So this is the brains of the whole system, right? This is how you're getting your, the power from your solar panel to your batteries and out to your loads. Two primary types here. We've got a PWM system and an MPPT. You might have heard those terms. How many people have heard those terms before? Good chunk of the crap, okay. So PWM is a pulse width modulated controller. These are the standard run of the mill, cheap ones that you can find everywhere, Harbor Freight, Home Depot, you name it, they've got um, PWM controllers. You can get them like 30 bucks is expensive for an MPPT controller as far as I'm concerned. You can find them for 15 bucks, you can find them at the flea market, um, they work. Uh, they're small, they're cheap, they're relatively effective, they're generally lower efficiency, um, and they require tighter matching. And by tighter matching, that means your solar panel and the battery bank that you're powering need to be closer in voltage to each other for these to be efficient. A solar panel like this one that puts out 37 volts open circuit on a 12 volt system with a PWM controller, it's not gonna be happy. You're gonna have really poor efficiency, the system's not gonna run very well, um, you're gonna not be very happy with that. You're not gonna get anywhere near that 250 watts out of that panel that you were expecting, right? Because that's the peak power. So uh, MPPT is kind of the way to go. If you're doing some sort of system that's efficient and you want it to be optimized and work well, um, you get what's called this maximum power point tracking uh, controller. These are very high efficiency, um, always over 80% pretty much. They'll be in the upper 90 percentile when they're running well. Um, and they're very compatible. So that means you can pretty much take almost any panel and almost any battery bank and have them work together. Uh, the way this works, there are literally huge inductors in there and capacitors, and it's a big buck or boost converter that will convert the powers between, um, convert the voltages and currents between the two um, regularly, very easily. The downside, well, of course, it costs more money, right? Because nothing comes for free. Uh, but they have come down in cost pretty significantly. 
10 years ago, you could not have gotten a 30 amp MTBT controller for $102 with two-day shipping, right? Okay, even without the two-day shipping part, but <laughs> they're pretty good. Question? Can we also add our wind generator into the MPPT controller uh, in parallel? Yeah, good question. Can you also add a, a wind generator or some other input power source to um, this controller? Uh, most standard controllers will have one input that they're used to receiving. Um, so in those instances where you're attaching like a wind generator or a water turbine or a generator input or something, you usually need some other control interfacing as well. Um, I won't go into depth in that here. We can talk afterwards if you like and talk about some ideas. Other questions? Yeah? I just want to behind you a question too. Oh, uh, yeah. Did you? I miss the point where you talked about controller RFI? Uh, no, it was a good segue actually. Thanks, Bruce. Um, <laughs> so, the controller RFI was the uh, comment that he was making. Uh, with both of these, you heard the term switching. And switching means that you're turning something on or off quickly. Um, and when there's a lot of current or power involved, turning things on or off generates a lot of radio frequency interference. Um, uh, anyone that's on HF knows that very well as QRM, and it's a very unfortunate thing. So you'll hear hash on a, on a radio system or a noise floor that just comes up the wazoo. So if you're running into that issue, uh, it very well, well may be this. There was a gentleman running a repeater system down in San Jose off his solar system, um, and it was great and wonderful and quiet in the evenings and in the early mornings, and as soon as the sun rose, the thing was noisy as no other, and you could barely hear anything. Its received sensitivity went to crap, and it couldn't hear anything. I, so, I bought a site a mile and a half from any paved road, and that's <laughs> exactly what it's like. And there you go, right? So even if you're out in the boonies and you have one of these set up, there can be a lot of uh, interference generated by them. So how do you resolve this? Uh, Look around for reviews. Um, there are hams out there like ourselves that have bought these and checked them. Uh, buy one and play with it. Um, find a friend with a spectrum analyzer, or you can put filtering in place. If you put it in a cabinet and you kind of are smart about how you're designing your site, um, you can do things to mitigate those. Um, if you're running an HF site, a remote base, as one of the options I mentioned earlier, it's going to be a much, much bigger problem because the switching frequencies are down in those ranges often um, than if you're setting up a 5 gigahertz radio site, like in my case. Another question back there? Yeah. Does one technology type better than the other? Does MPPT better than PWM for RFI? So the question was, is MPPT or PWM better for RFI than the other? Uh, probably MPPT is going to be better. They're both switching technologies. Um, and MPPT will vary its um, content much more, so it will be harder to debug and chase down. Um, but that's kind of just anecdotally as well. It really depends on the design of the controller. If it's and one that's bought that's RF quiet, it's from a reputable manufacturer, chances are they've passed a lot more FCC certifications than if you're getting something from AliExpress, for example. Yeah, a uh, question back. Uh, does this get worse if you're going to AC with an inverter? Does this get worse when you're going to AC with an inverter? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> so as soon as you're doing more switching, in that case, you're turning a DC signal into an AC waveform with boost converters and switching and a lot of filtering, yes, you're going to have even more RFI to deal with. So same thing goes there. Uh, you're going to have to spend some money to get some good ones. A lot of questions. Good. Back. Could you put your loads off of a um, uh, battery isolator to take this out of the picture? Yeah, so could you put your loads on a battery isolator to take the controller out of the picture? Um, yes, there are a bunch of different uh, setups that you could do. Um, if you look at typical off-grid sites that are grid tied, um, your loads are actually coming directly off the battery through a separate uh, battery management unit, effectively. Um, and then the charger is just charging the battery. It's not actually handling the load. Um, in this instance, in kind of the four-piece diagram I drew earlier, I'm using the controller as the load management as well. So it does your under-voltage cutout. It does your overcurrent protection for the battery uh, for the um, controller. And it also, um, you can remotely control and shut down the system through that as well. So kind of depends. And, yeah. So yeah, quick question. You say 30 amps on this. Is that 30 amps going out the output? Because you mentioned you're using this for the load control, or is this 30 amps charging or bulk? Like, what is that? How is that rating determined? Great segue. So the question was, uh, what is the current? I didn't place the door. Uh, what is the current rating on these controllers? Um, is it the input current rating or the output current rating? Uh, it depends. Is really the answer. I, I think okay. no standard around this. Uh, usually, it's going to be your output rating, um, but it could also be based on the input. The thing is, the input will vary depending on the battery voltage and the voltage of the panels that you're dealing with, what that actual current number is. So um, if we look at it, there's a great example here on the bottom right. So this is a 20 amp MPBT controller that can do 12 or 24 volt um, battery systems. 
At 12 volts, it can do a 260 watt panel, because that's some current that's, do the math, around 20 amps, right? And then at 24 volts, it can handle a much larger panel, a 520 watt panel, because the current number is still around that 20 amps, right? When you double your system voltage, your current halved. So you're able to run a panel that's twice the size. So in that sense, uh, yes, it's effectively the input of the system, um, but it's, it can now run at twice the amount of power and it can handle a lot more. So if you're running a big panel with a high voltage, the higher the voltage of your batteries as well, the smaller controller you can get to handle it because they'll be matched more closely. Question back? Yeah, so the question was, how quickly can you push the power back into the battery to recharge it? Um, it depends, is another answer. Uh, the lead-acid batteries, you can charge quickly, but again, charging things quickly or discharging things quickly will reduce their lifetime. Um, typically, lead-acid manufacturers, if you're just recharging a battery, like you to be pretty slow. So like 0.1 to 0.3 C charging rate, which means like between three and 10 hours to charge a battery full. Um, now, if you only have 3.4 hours of usable sun in the day, that's kind of a problem. So usually you're gonna be doing a bulk charge much faster than that. Um, but again, it depends on your setup. So if you oversize your panel too high, um, you could be dumping a lot of power into these panel, into these battery packs. Um, on a site that I set up with a 435 watt panel on just a 100 amp hour battery, um, we could charge that battery pretty darn fast, right? I was saying like 45 minutes or an hour, you can get the thing full, which let out some batteries don't like from zero to 100. Now, if they're only going from 80 to 100, it's not actually gonna charge that. It's not actually gonna damage the battery that much because it's gonna slow down the charge rate anyway. Is any water maintenance required on lead acid batteries? Uh, not for sealed type lead acid batteries. If you have a open electrolyte type cell, then you'd have to re replenish it during the maintenance cycle. Yeah, question in the front. In this kind of, kind of uh, controller, you have the uh, input voltage on 24 volts. What about if your DC load is 12 volts? Does yeah. that compensate that thing? Yeah, so good question. So um, for this specific controller, if we're running on a 24 volt battery system, can our load be on 12 volt? Um, not directly from the controller, but I'll show you what um, I've actually done on our site because we had some 12 volt systems that we had to run off this 24 volt system. So real quick, just to kind of touch on the solar controller sizing, um, kind of four main things in here that matter, right? So one is your solar panel size. We kind of briefly touched on that. How many watts your panel can put out? You have to make sure your controller can handle at least that much. If it's from AliExpress, quite a bit more than that much. If it's from some reputable source that you trust, it can be matched pretty closely, right? Um, the battery voltage obviously is key, depending on the type of system you're running, it has to be compatible. Um, the peak currents of the DC load, so if we're running that 13 amp PA super repeater, <laughs> we have to make sure that we can at least handle 13 amps of surge current on the uh, load board. Um, and then the maximum input voltage, right? So I listed that open circuit voltage of 37 volts for that pack. There are some um, controllers that cannot handle 37 volts at their input. Um, they can only handle 12 volts or 17 volts at their input. So you need to make sure that those are compatible when you're buying your panel and your controller. Otherwise, you'll be in for a nasty magic smoke surprise. Okay, so for this example, right, um, we say we have a 250 watt panel, we've got 24 volt battery bank, uh, we only had a two amp load because we did that math to that 37 watts. Um, our panel had a 37 volt open circuit, that's the VOC number, um, and an eight, an almost nine amp uh, short circuit current, right? So those are kind of the maximum numbers that the panel can put up. So as a result, if we go through and put some nice little check boxes between these two models from this one manufacturer that we happen to look at, their 20 amp model uh, has 12 or 20 volt volt battery, cool, we can use our 24 volt battery. Uh, the battery current, 20 amps, cool, that's great. Loaded current, 20 amps, that's well above our two amps. No problem, well, 10x, that's great. Uh, our, our photovoltaic input short circuit current, 25 amps. We said ours is only nine, so we're fine there as well. And our maximum solar input power at 24 volts, 520 watts, we're gold. So we can use the 20 amp version of this guy, no problem, it'll handle this panel and this battery pack just fine. Now, if we were running a 12 volt system with this exact same panel, you can see we're getting pretty close to that 260 watt max PV number. So if we actually decided instead of one 250 watt panel, we're gonna do three 100 watt panels in parallel, and we're running at 12 volts, we'd have to go up to the bigger controller to handle the current, right? So kind of the give and take there when you're uh, choosing these. All right, 
And then the fun part, deployment. Um, so those are cheap harbor freight channels. You'll notice the color differences between all the doping. Um, <laughs> not even kidding, right? So you'll get a large variety between them. Um, I chart, but this goes to your question from earlier, uh, what did you do for this site? So for this specific site, this was our ARCnet, uh, the end arc site. Um, we have, so the block here, everything on the right is that DC load from the earlier category, right? So we have our solar panel, we have our solar controller, we have our battery bank, two 12 volt batteries, and then we have all our loads. So in this case, it was those five items, the uplink router, the access point, the webcam, the ethernet switch, and then the analog telephone adapter, right? Uh, the first three all run at 24 volts. Excellent, that's why we chose a 24 volt battery system. So we just have these uh, two passive and one active PoE injectors, that's power or ethernet, so it sends the signals up to the mast on ethernet cables. Um, and then these two, unfortunately, run on 12 volts. So the ethernet switch and the grand stream, they both run on 12 volts. So what do you do while well, you throw a DC-DC converter in here? And then Bruce shouts up and says, Marcel, you're putting another RFI source on this radio site. Right. You've got to be careful. And the answer is yes, absolutely. You have to be careful, right? So here are your two converters. So this is the 24 to 48 volt one for the active PoE injection, and then a 24 down to 12 volt buck converter to get down for your ethernet switch and your phone adapter, right? So the fortunate thing in this site is we're not running HF. Uh, we're running VHF, but they're outside of the metal shipping container. They're never inside the metal shipping container, which is where this sits. Um, and then the signals are going up to the mast on the other end of the uh, system as well. So definitely things to consider. I'm glad you brought it up as well. Um, and something you have to keep in mind depending on where you're deploying and what you're supporting. Right? Our HF remote base site is going to need a lot, pay a lot closer attention to what it chooses. And by golly, don't buy these little um, Droke adapters from Amazon for 25 bucks. Um, go get something a little nicer. Vicor makes some really cool ones. Okay, uh, so that's what the inside looks like. That that tray is now in this lovely little $40 cabinet from Lowe's. There are the battery and the controller from earlier that you guys saw as well. And then we plop this panel on the roof. Again, the angle of this panel is roughly that of the sun at the lowest point in uh, Cupertino during winter. It's pointed roughly due south. Um, and then we've got the little mast at the end here with the antennas on it. And boy, is that a shiny, clean antenna. Save that in your memory banks. Or sorry, shiny, shiny clean That's solar tower, right. right? It's a very nice, clean solar tower. We're locked up for two hours. Yeah, about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, very nice, very clean solar panel. So that's putting out 250 watts when the sun pointed directly at it in the middle of the day. Pretty cool, actually. They also get very hot, and when solar panels get hotter, they don't put out as much power. So that leads us right into the kind of last part of this, which is the maintenance, right? So uh, here's our lovely photo from earlier. Uh, similarly, your batteries are, so the two main things I want to cover, batteries and then the uh, panels themselves, right? So the first one, batteries, uh, typically lead acid batteries, sealed lead acids will be manufacturer rated for kind of the four to five year life cycle range. Um, now, this again goes based on what depth of discharge you're doing and kind of various factors on the battery, including quality. Um, some of the lower cost ones you will buy will not last that long. Um, the Cal Poly Radio Club just had to replace two of their backup batteries uh, after two years, not even, um, and they didn't make it five years, even though they were just in float service. So uh, spend a little bit more money and then you're not replacing it as often, especially if it's an eight hour drive down a dirt road uphill both ways in the snow. Okay. Uh, so again, set cycling and temperature dependent, right? So if your batteries are being cycled very like heavily, so if their depth of discharge on an average day is very high, you might have to replace your batteries in six months. You might have to replace them in a year or two. Um, they might not even make it anywhere close to that five-year lifetime. So the bigger you make the, the bank, the longer it will last, but then the more batteries you have to replace when you do have to replace them. So there's a trade-off there as well. Um, and this is probably one of the most costly parts of the maintenance. This is the one quasi-consumable part of an off-grid solar system that you have to keep in mind. Um, there are other battery chemistries and different types of batteries that will last longer than this for sure. Um, they might require you to do periodic maintenance but not replace it as often. So that's something to consider as well. Um, this is a photo on the right of the uh, battery bank backup system for the lights in a um, parking garage, of all things. They need battery backups for the parking garage lights so when the power goes out, people don't crash into each other. Um, and you can see this battery right here, the fourth from the left, the top of it's just exploded off. These are the pieces of it. So um, I happened to catch the guys coming in with a huge pickup truck full of lead acid batteries to swap out the banks, and that was the photo. 
Um, huge bus bars linking the whole thing across the front. So, yes, keep an eye on the packs and make sure you know how, to, how much it's going to cost to replace them. Yes, sir. Shadowing. Yes, would you like to talk about shadowing later? Um, or you can talk about it now. I, <laughs> no. Okay, so, yeah, on the, so shadowing to the point of solar panel maintenance, uh, uh, when you set up your solar panel and there's a tree in front of it and that tree is a small sapling right today, it's great. At the end of the spring, it might not be a small sapling anymore. Uh, it very likely might be a large, frothy, leafy tree that's covering up your panel in the middle of the day. Um, and then in that winter time frame, your 3.4 hours turned into uh, 1.2 hours, and that's problematic. So uh, tree maintenance is a great example, uh, shadowing, uh, not setting it up right next to a large building that's about to get installed next door. Those things are helpful. So um, keep that in mind when you're picking your location. Um, the other one is panel cleaning. So this one's easy to forget if you're not visiting your site regularly or you're not, um, not monitoring it closely and watching the charge and discharge curves every day. Um, that beautiful clean solar panel from earlier, two months later, two months, and it looks like that. Um, let's place our guess on how much power that could put out. From 250 watts, do I have 150, 125, 25, 80? I don't actually know. It was bad. So uh, this is the big breakdown. Um, this was in the middle of the summer. They were doing construction nearby, so there was a lot of dust in the air. Um, we were cleaning this panel every couple months just to keep it um, going smoothly. So come up with a bottle of water and a brush and a cloth and just clean it off. Not too bad. Yes? So is there any good way to get that as a metric, a data of some sort that you can tell that your panel's getting dirty remotely. Yeah, so the question is if there's a good way to get a metric or a data on if your panel's getting dirty or not. Um, absolutely. So some controllers like the one I showed earlier have a RS-485 interface on them. So you can plug it in, you can have a little server running there, you can get all the stats you'd like out of that controller. And then based on, you have to kind of map it to what the sunlight's doing or just look at averages for how much current it's putting out, what the peak power numbers that you're getting from the panel during different parts of the year. And absolutely, you can watch that. So you can actually look at the curves and see them kind of deteriorate. Someone threw a newspaper over it, right? So, yeah. Yes? On your 24 volt systems, and you need some 12 volt power as well, mm -hmm. we have fooled around with just pulling 12 volts off of one battery. Yeah, so, and, and you want to know if that's a good idea or not. Yes, because on uh, small loads it should be okay, but larger loads, not so. Yeah, so the question was, on a 24-volt system, they're running some 12-volt stuff just off one of the two batteries in the series string. Is that okay? Uh, in theory, no, but you could do it, right? Um, if it's a small load and it's not taking a lot of power, it's not going to make much difference, but it will affect the balance of those two packs, right? Um, that one battery will probably die sooner than the other one, um, and it'll just kind of mess with your system. So it's something to keep in mind. Yeah, a uh, question up here, I think, yeah. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about cloud shower, shadowing? I was uh, down in my uh, station, and a uh, big cloud was covering everything, and uh, all of a sudden the sun came out bright, and I just happened to look at my output. The system was outputting more than the system was ready for. <laughs> it did that for a short while. Yep. But I was really amazed at the uh, cooler panel, how much more they output. Yeah, so um, we can touch on that maybe more in detail after the presentation, but he was asking about uh, cloud shadowing. The panel cooled down, there was a cloud over it. When the cloud moved off and the sun was on it again, suddenly the system was putting out a ton of power because the panel wasn't as warm, and probably if you had an MPPT controller, it was at a different power point. Um, and then when the sun then hit it, it then suddenly was off whack, and then it would throw out different numbers. Well, right? well the so. important part is uh, shaded cell does not conduct. That's correct, yeah. So shaded cell is a diode, and if it doesn't have light on it, it won't actually conduct. So, so I want to finish up and then we can get a couple more questions during the transition between them. Uh, just a couple more photos of extreme panel maintenance that you need to do. Uh, bottom left is uh, cement dust, bottom right is s snow, uh, and then the top is that lovely alkaline salt out in uh, the Nevada desert. So I just love showing those at the end because it kind of gives you an idea. Make sure you know what you're signing up for. If you're setting up on a lovely grass, grassy field somewhere, it's fine until the cows lean up on it and break all your panels. Um, <laughs> If you're setting it up in the middle of the desert, it's going to run really hot and your batteries might blow. So mm. things to consider and always have a good time. Um, that's pretty much it. So thank you all for coming out. Um, we'll take questions and stuff at the end as well. <laughs> Just the two call-outs. Um, one presentation will be on QRZ uh, once I get it posted up and we'll put the copy of the video as well hopefully. Uh, you can reach out to me and my two plugs. If you'd like me to speak at your club or organization, feel free to shoot me an email. And if you need a volunteer cl tower climber for anything, I also offer those services. So uh, thank you very much for coming. Hope you guys enjoy the rest of the conference. Okay.